We're in the last week of War of the Spark preview season and we still have some huge bombs to drop. More planeswalkers, more lore, and more constructed playable craziness. We're gonna throw so much at you today and in case you didn't know, you can click the first link in the description for a chance at winning a free booster box of War of the Spark shipped anywhere in the world absolutely free. Just sub to the YouTube channel, follow on Twitter, Twitch, and Instagram and you gain entries for free. I do hope you enjoy this War of the Spark preview video and if you do, remember to hit that like button. I know I say it every time, but like, hit it though, please. It's just so cute just sitting there. All right, let's do this thing. Commence the end game is four of anything and two blue for an instant. This spell can't be countered. Draw two cards, then a mass X, where X is the number of cards in your hand. First thing, look at that artwork. Hot dang, that is powerful. Now, playability wise, not being able to be countered, very nice for a six mana spell at instant speed. And you can drop this at the end of your opponent's turn, draw two cards, and at the very least, get a two two or buff your army plus two plus two. Thank goodness this is instant speed, otherwise it'd just be terrible. The flavor's there. Bolus gains knowledge and makes his army more more powerful, I can dig it, but I'm not terribly excited about the playability itself. If you have a bunch of cards in your hand, then I can absolutely get behind a 5-5 five, five, or even a 4-4 four, four for 6 at instant speed, but you can't always guarantee that. The spell is expensive and would only ever really go in a control type deck where you're using resources to stay alive until you get to the point where you can actually cast this. Jury's out, but I'm thinking clunky, pretty clunky. Finale of Revelation is X and double blue for a sorcery. Draw X cards. If X is 10 or more, instead shuffle your graveyard into your library, draw X cards, untap up to five lands, and you have no maximum hand size for the rest of the game. Exile Finale of Revelation. I just, wow. This card has a lot going on. I mean, just so much. Before we talk power, the flavor here is insane. Ugin thinks that by destroying Bolus's gem, he can cut off his ability to enter his meditation realm and manipulate man effectively because that is basically what the gem does. Most people think the gem is what makes Bolas a walker to begin with. Anyways, Ugin versus Bolas, it was all coming down to this at some point, wasn't it? Oof. Anyways, talk and playability, Finale of Revelation is a giant dumb mythic. If you can find a way to ramp into this, then it's beyond powerful and will probably win you the game. That is all. Deliver unto evil is three mana for a sorcery. Choose up to four target cards in your graveyard. If you control a Bolas Planeswalker, return those cards to your hand. Otherwise, an opponent chooses two of them. Leave the chosen cards in your graveyard and put the rest into your hand. Exile, deliver unto evil. What an incredibly interesting card. Three mana to recur two cards and then this is gone forever. Seems a little dramatic, but whatever. If you control the new Nico Bolas, you do get all four cards back, which is sweet, but controlling any of the Bolas Planeswalkers anywhere isn't exactly a walk in the park. This is like a weird version of Gifts Ungiven. I have no idea if this is playable anywhere to be honest with you. I'm more enamored with the artwork. Seb McKinnon, you're insane, friendo, holy butts. But looking at it, it does look like the Gatewatch is surrendering to Bolas, so there has to be some kind of scheme at work because none of them would do that. I see theories running around of Jace using Spark Double and trying to trick Bolas, but I don't know. We'll have to see. What a crazy world we're in right now. The Elder Spell is double black for a sorcery. Destroy any number of target planeswalkers. Choose a planeswalker you control. Put two loyalty counters on it for each planeswalker destroyed this way. What? Seriously? Two mana to annihilate walkers, all of them, and you get something for it for two mana? What? I honestly don't even know what to say. Besides the fact that it's only two friggin' mana, it absolutely destroys all walkers, including your own if you want, and then you ramp up a single walker to ultimate levels of power and unleash their game-ending ability. Truly the Elder Spell is all powerful. Think about it. Play this in Super Friends, play a bunch of walkers, use the Elder Spell to basically kill all of them besides Venser, or Narset, or Teferi, or a Johnny Steadfast, or Tezzeret Artifice Master, or Kiora the Crashing Wave, or Ugin, or Karn Liberated. You get where I'm going with this. The Elder Spell is outrageous, overpowered, broken beyond reason, and terrifying. One of the strongest cards I've ever seen on the face of it. Mother of Nyx, this card makes no sense. Spark Harvest is one black mana for a sorcery. As an additional cost to cast this spell, sacrifice a creature or pay four mana. Destroy target creature or planeswalker. Quote, with the harvest of Domri's spark, the elder spell began to fuel Bolus' ascension to godhood. Well, rest in peace, Domri. For all of you Gruel fans out there, I am so sorry. The card itself is pretty interesting. Optionally cheap planeswalker removal is interesting at common, certainly limited playable, but we're here because of the lore. Domri, you deserved better, man.
Ashiok Dream Renders one of anything in two hybrid blue and black mana for a five loyalty legendary planeswalker. Spells and abilities your opponent's control can cause their controller to search their library. You can minus one and target player puts the top four cards of their library into their graveyard, then exile each opponent's graveyard. <laughs> what? Ashiok should not be an uncommon. This is easily a rare quality planeswalker, probably the best uncommon walker in the entire set hands down, and obviously made for competitive play, probably in modern. Ashiok's absurd. She's really cheap to start, and as soon as she enters the battlefield, she turns off fetch lands and tutors of any kind, and then she naturally comes with five, count them, five activations of an ability that mills the opponent for, and then immediately as part of the resolution, exiles those cards and the rest in your opponent's graveyards. Not yours though, that's huge. That's a single resolution, which means your opponents don't get much of a chance to do anything. This is a monstrous beater in competitive play. It turns off graveyard strategies in an instant, except yours since you can mill yourself and exile everyone else's yard. Oh, it's so good for commander. So good against spell slinging decks with graveyard interaction. Dredge, living end, storm, amulet, titan. Then seriously, commander, just Muldrotha alone. Oh, I'm done. Just this is better than your average uncommon by far. Casualties of War is two of anything, two black and two green for a sorcery. Choose one or more. Destroy target artifact, destroy target creature, destroy target enchantment, destroy target land, destroy target planeswalker. Uh, sure, why not? Six mana to destroy five permanents, basically of your choice, including a land and a walker and an enchantment. I just, what? This card is grossly powerful in commander because that color combination totally needs more destruction. I have no idea what's going on with this set, but it's all ridiculous. You're honestly looking at a commander state for as long as that format exists. Get Rog, Atroxa, Marin, Tassiger, yeah, this is gonna be around forever. Watley, Heart of the Sun is two of anything in one hybrid green and white mana for a seven loyalty legendary planeswalker. Each creature you control assigns combat damage equal to its toughness rather than its power. You can minus three and you gain life equal to the greatest toughness among creatures you control. First we got Teo and now Watley. Arcades is just getting friend after friend up in here. Watley is basically designed to be a toughness matters deck and because her color identity is white and green, she can be in either Arcades or in something like Doran. Nice flexibility there. While her minus three Three is great for stabilizing against fast decks. She exists to basically be an enchantment, giving your walls spikes. Lover in commander, lover in a standard wall deck with my boy Arcades. Cards like this, I'm just a fan. Soul Diviners, one blue and one black for a 2-3 zombie wizard. You can tap it and remove a counter from an artifact, creature land, or a planeswalker you control to draw a card. Quote, as the Eternal's cold fingers tightened around his throat, Domri realized what kind of master he had rushed to serve. Come on, this is just so sad. Even with Domri on the wrong side, it's just, it's so sad. Of course, this won't be the saddest thing you see this week. Wait, um, never mind that. Anyways, Soul Diviner is pretty strong and limited, basically letting you draw a card whenever you want, considering the massive amount of walkers running around. Beyond that, what fuel for our Traxa decks? Or really any deck that utilizes counters, so basically, you know, a Traxa. Easily repeatable card draws nothing to scoff at. The Diviner's really cheap, has nice stats at 2-3. Relevant creature types in Zombie and Wizard, easy colors to play, with a solid ability that synergizes with a ton of cards. Yeah, this is good. Blast Zone is a non-basic land card that enters the battlefield with the charge counter on it. You can tap it to add one colorless. You can also pay double X and tap it to put X charge counters on it. You can also pay three mana, tap it and sacrifice it to destroy each non-land permanent with converted mana cost equal to the number of charge counters on Blast Zone. Well, isn't this an angry ratchet bomb? It does cost a whole bunch to get ticked up, but being a land is hugely important here. Ratchet bomb and the like are so easy to get rid of because they're mostly artifacts or enchantments. Lots of removal target them, but not this thing. Land destruction isn't really everywhere. And while this does take a huge mana investment to tick up, you can trust that it'll stay safe more often than not, especially in limited or commander or even standard, at least most of the time. Now a few things. First, it can't destroy tokens because it comes with a charge counter already on it. Second, you can proliferate the heck out of this. So at least that's something. Third, this is a great targeted board wipe against walkers, enchantments, artifacts, or creatures you don't like. Personally, I'm a huge fan of this in commander. It's so dang versatile.
It is absolutely absurd that we can be into our third week of War of the Spark preview season and we're still seeing outrageous stuff. Cards with designs that we've never even dreamed of. I can't get over the Elder Spell. I just, I can't. It's too strong. How nuts. It's just nuts. I need to know where you're at with the set, so please let me know what you're thinking. What's your favorite part about the set so far? I gotta know, so comment down below and we'll talk about it. Also, do not forget to enter the giveaway for a free War of the Spark booster box delivered anywhere in the world. Just be subbed to the channel and click the first link in the description. And uh, as always, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. This video is brought to you in part by TCGPlayer.com. Despite how bonkers the set is, you can pre-order boxes of War of the Spark on TCG Player right now for only $97 each, much cheaper than a lot of online retailers, and don't have a local game store or yours is charging way too much, this is the perfect place to buy them, delivered right to your door on release, and it helps the channel out a bunch. It's a huge win-win for everyone, seriously. We all win and get hugs. Who doesn't love a good hug? Enjoy.